Hi there, and welcome to Inside the Wooniverse, a podcast brought to you from the corner of Fringe and Main. I'm your host, Colette Baron Reed, and joining us today is the defender of female awesomeness, Lisa Lister. She is an artist, psychotherapeutic coach, somatic movement practitioner, and author of six really interesting books, including Love Your Lady Landscape, which, which was one of my favorite books, and her latest book, Self Sorcery. Lisa is also a well woman and womb yoga therapist, womb and rhythmic massage practitioner, and offers support, guidance, tools, and counsel to women who are exploring, navigating, and wanting to heal their relationship with their body, power, sex, creativity, spirituality, pleasure, and passion. Welcome to the Wooniverse, Lisa. Whoop, whoop. Thank you so much. What a gorgeous introduction. Hello. Woo. You are one of the most interesting people ever that, uh, you know, when I read your book, Witch, I just fell in love with you. And I was like, I really, really, really want to talk to this woman. So I'm very excited that um, you said yes to come on the podcast, but I'd really love to start at the beginning of your story. When did you first start to sense magic and subtle energies? Oh, um, so interesting. I think like, so my nan was like, she's from a traveler. She's from a traveler background. So, um, she already had, you know, a touch of the magic about her. And I think spending time with her meant that I was really able to kind of sit her, sit at her apron strings really, and kind of witness her in action. Like she'd give me herbs to smell. She'd say like, what do you think that does? What do you think that does? And, and like, just really encourage me to um, trust my own intuition really um and so as Mm -hmm. my mom however not so keen on it like she also had like she had a lot of um potential gifts that she definitely because she really wanted to fit in with society she didn't she didn't want any of that stuff so it was almost like my nan would be like don't tell your mama but we're doing this but we're gonna and it was an exploration and I feel like yeah it started there it's it really started just in the exploration, really. My nan encouraging me to be curious about all the things, really, whether it's herbs, whether it was about what I could see, what I could heal, hear, sorry, what I could feel. Uh huh. Have you dove in at all uh, to the, your traveler lineage at all since then? I mean, it's kind of interesting. I I'm, I really identify with what you said because my father um, taught me how to read Turkish coffee cups when I was little. Oh. I also had a nanny, not a nan. Yeah. As, as this was a Scottish nanny who looked after me, who was a, who was a psychic who read cards and whatever, and saw that I had the gift. And my my dad had it through his lineage. Um, so it was interesting. Did you actually track it? You know, now that you do this full time, did you track, you know, how the lineage, the traveler lineage has impacted you? Cause I, I get it. My mom also was like your mom. I don't want anything to do with that. Right. So it's like, we want to fit in, go away. Right. So curious, curious how this came about for you. For sure. So I think for me, um, my nan's, um, my mom's kind of lineage is Irish traveler. And my dad was Romany traveler so I mean you just gotta look at the coloring to (laughs) know in this one how and why that works so yeah it was definitely um it's definitely definitely in both of them and I think I'm the first one in my family not to have ever lived in a um a caravan (laughs) I think like to ever stay static but interesting um, mm, it's not my most happy place to stay static either but but yeah I feel like it was from there um witnessing in both of them that like so this was energetics that were in me and so yeah, like for most part of my, you know, I spent a lot of time in my nan. So I'm very blessed that I've got all that medicine. But then I became a teenager and then I got really interested in far more interesting. <laughs> kissing boys. <laughs> kissing boys was way more interesting than magic. <laughs> <laughs> right. That was magic alone, right? That, we, w- that awoke eroticism. <laughs> That's a different type of magic. That's right. That's right. So um, I, again, from what I hear, there is there's a resistance between the two paths. You come from two 
distinct traveler backgrounds, mm-hmm. one Irish, the other Romani, right? Yes. So Romani. Yes. And so we know that that is very specific to a way of life, a, a, a viewpoint of how the world works. But then at the same time, being um, impacted by somebody who really wanted to belong in a very different world. So how did you experience that? Did it impact your sense of being safe in that world or where you belonged? Or did you kind of had a feeling that you didn't know where you belonged? Yeah, the latter, I think. I feel like only now, um, even in the last probably eight years, I've started to be like, right, okay, this is who I am. And I can accept that. And it was part of, it was definitely part of claiming back my own power, really, my own understanding of who I was, was in that kind of recognition that I've never fitted anywhere. Like, so I'd go to, I went to a normal school. I was like a proper geek. You know, I I got really geeky, which was just not (laughs) heard of, not heard of in traveler families, right? Like when you're 13, you kind of got to get on and get and do the other things. You know, I went to university, which was totally unheard of um, because I tried, I really wanted to fit in. I did. And like I said, I didn't, I didn't turn my back on what my Nana had taught me, but I was just like, I'm way more interested in like boys, like I say, or (laughs) like literally just um, studying and like trying to be normal, Mm -hmm. whatever normal was. Um, and then I started, you know, and, and that's when everything kind of started, like, you know, I was going to university and I was, and I thought I had to do it this way. I had to, everything's had to look a certain way. We had to do a certain thing. And I desperately wanted to try and fit in, you know, a traveler community here in the UK is not, is not something like, that you'd be proud of. I mean, you should be, you absolutely Mm -hmm. should be, but like people aren't. But I understand it's marginalized. Mm. You, you come from a marginalized community. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh What did you study in university out of curiosity? Media and culture. Isn't that interesting? Right. That it's just like, well, how do we fit in? How does this work? How does this, how, how do we bridge all these different pieces? I went to Absolutely. law school, God forbid, but whatever. Oh, did you? <laughs> Same. My parents. Oh my God. You tried to put me a square peg in a round hole. I will tell you, I totally understand that. Where the heck do I fit in? Oh, you want me to be this? Okay. Nothing worked. So um, let's go to, I want to reference one of your books. Um, in your book, let's segue over because we mm. have so much to talk about. Love your your lady landscape. Yes. You speak about living life from the neck up, disconnecting from your female body, living life like a dude. This is what you're quoting. <laughs> I'm quoting you from the book because it was an easier option versus living life as a woman who was never seen nor heard. Can you speak about this time in your life? Mm, yeah, there was a time when I was a little bit younger where I was mute, completely mute. I didn't speak. Um, like I didn't think that what I was had to say was useful. So then it, phys- it manifested physically so that I literally couldn't speak. And so a lot of people experience wow. that when they've experienced trauma or and whilst I imagine now looking back, like it's quite a traumatizing act to be a human that doesn't fit into societal yeah. kind of programming and boxes um and that may have been enough to do that but yeah that kind of and it was a period and it and it stretched between two and a bit years right where I just didn't speak and I could and then there was a time when I physically couldn't speak um right and and yeah, yeah and and so that kind of led to me work trying to figure out what can I like what can I do I just have to do this life like everyone else is doing it like like nothing made sense like the things I could see and feel and hear and witness like made Mm -hmm. no sense because now like no one was guiding that path and so like literally I just went straight up into my head disconnected from the body completely and was just like someone driven by that space. This is so interesting because I, I I know so many of us can relate to this. You know, I completely disconnected um, as well. Now I had vi- I had something violent happen to me when I was nineteen. Right. That's I'm not going to go into right now, but uh, it was much easier to be. Uh, more aggressive or predatory or, or, you know, like, I'm not going to care. I'm not going to let myself be vulnerable. I'm not, you know, like, so there's this kind of thing, this power that if a woman can't speak or can't be heard or don't, or what you say doesn't count, then there is a level of, well, I need to find a different way to protect myself. So I think that's what I got from your book. Beautiful. Um, Yeah. You know, right. You know, like, it's not safe even. So the idea of living like a quote unquote dude 
mm. is I, I told you, I really was, was very, very touched by, by this particular book because I think a lot of people, a lot of women yeah. or, or people who identify as female, yeah, absolutely. Um, finding a manner in which we can safely as women, we should be able to have a voice and to share. And Colette, I don't know if it is safe. I'll be honest. Like, you know, and I've said, I said in which, I said in a lot of books, you know, and it's, it's the wish, it's the hope that we feel safe enough to express yeah. ourselves. Like that feels like such an the important hope. part of the work for me to do. But like, is it safe? Well, clearly not. Right. Like, we just have to look at the news. We just have to look yeah. around the globe to witness that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like, we have to support each other to, to try like we have to try and find ways in which we can find pockets of safety with each other, you know, with, yep. with other humans yes. and with, like, like here, me and you sitting together, you know, being able to have these conversations, a blessing. And hopefully somebody hears like something that we share today and something drops in because we've been able to yeah. express what we're thinking and feeling and I'm not saying it's always comfortable and it's definitely not for me like I still recognize <laughs> that, that that one that was mute like I still recognize like whoa this is so tricky for me to speak out loud and it is like I've done training I've done all yeah. sorts but unless but what's how and, and you train but like what I've witnessed is come into the body come into the body and trust that's the only place I can speak from as you're talking, I'm even feeling that sense of constraint in my throat of, you know, how often it's, you know, where, ways in which we have learned how to manipulate our words in order to find a way to be safe and still say what we need to. It's still not, it's not a time where we can just be 100% that, but, and I love that you brought up hope that hope without certainty. I think that we have <laughs> to hope without the attachment to the right. end game. And like you said, have these conversations where there's compassion and care and yes. we listen and we share about these things because they still hurt. Yeah. Still, it's still hard for me too. Right. You know, and still and hard for me too. you know, you have this yeah. gorgeous podcast, you have this space. People think because I kind of, <laughs> I like hold ceremony, hold ritual, but that's because I've, you know, I've worked out that I have to be in my body. And that was the point, right? That I wasn't in my body. Yeah. And so when we recognize that our throat also is like as above, so below, like mirrors our vaginal wall, mirrors our cervix, yes. right? And so we have, when we have constriction in our throat, we have constriction in our vaginal wall. If we have constriction in our vaginal wall, we have constriction in our throat. And so recognizing that there is this beautiful mirror space and that we have to practice like we have to try like I said that is the hope that's my only ask is that we try and we share even if it's shaky like I'm not claiming to be someone that speaks in memes or or beautiful sound bites but I do know yeah. that it comes from mm -hmm. my belly it comes from the python s that sits in my belly the truth that I speak and that's all I can trust yeah that's exactly. And so when we bring ourselves back into the mm. womb space that, we're, oh, I have so many questions. Okay. So, <laughs> oh my goodness, this is such an interesting conversation. Okay. So I want to go back to love your lady landscape, yes. and then we're going to speak more about this vulnerability, this space of vulnerability that, you know, that is happening right now, I think. So you, but you bring it up in here, um, which I thought was fascinating. When you talk, uh, you recounted a story about a Mayan priestess shaman named Rosa mm -hmm. sharing that the pelvis is known as the second skull. I really want you to share a little bit about that because you've already referenced now when we come from our belly, we come from our womb and the relationship between our throats and our vagina. Tell me a little yeah. bit about this. And our skull the same for this beautiful pelvis bowl right so if we're up in our skull then and 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 our skull holds like this beautiful brain and all of this good stuff but if we stay in the skull and not in our pelvis and for so many of us as women as well the pelvic the pelvis is tilted it's been shaped it's been held a certain way and we hold it a certain way when we hold our belly in we're then tilting our pelvis we're told in yoga like tuck your tuck your tailbone under don't tuck your tailbone right. under don't do that you know and it's it's like actually recognizing that <laughs> we have this beautiful mirror like we are as above so below we have this like 
like you know the 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 the, um, the inside of our mouths are exactly the si- same as the inside of our lips and our in our vaginal wall, right? So everything is mirrored. So this skull is, uh, you know, we've got this pelvic bowl head situation, and and so if our hips are not aligned then our neck can, you know, and then we could be like, if if we're on our phones all day and we're looking at our phones, like we're pulling our neck out of, out of shape. Our ball gets heavy with the head and then our pelvis, our pelvis completely like moves, moves from where it's, from its like natural alignment. And so all we're ever looking for is like not to reshape all it ever is, is like natural alignment. Like, can we just like, can we recognize where our pelvis is? And yeah, and can we then recognize how our head feels on our beautiful shoulders? And then can we create some like holistic kind of natural space where we're not holding our bellies in, where we're not tilting our pelvises so our tailbones are tucked under, where we're not (sighs) pulling our shoulders back so hard, where we're not looking down at our phones. It's like, oh, can we find some natural alignment where everything is where it can be? beautifully and feel yummy as opposed to being contorted and shaped and by societal ideas of how we should be as women versus like how our bodies naturally want to move and be you know what's really interesting i had to i had to unlearn Mm. um because i i was again this is just my experience i'm not telling anybody not to do yoga or whatever but i had to unlearn a lot of the pelvic um, tilting and all of the yeah. contortions, uh, because it was actually creating a lot of stress in my hip area. And wow. so as the whole nine yards and, and, oh yeah, I got completely out of alignment. Um, and also it related back to when the first trauma happened right. there. Right. So, and, and, so when I finally found somebody to work with me, they were like, you can't, all those things that you're doing. And I would always suck my stomach in and hold it in. And, you know, and I even wore a corset when I had my band. So it would like suck me in, like to be acceptable. It was such an interesting thing. And I had to, I grieved so deeply because I thought that that's what would make me attractive and whatever. And then do all these, the way I was holding myself was very, very interesting. And I was so scared to let my belly out. So terrified. <laughs> it was just yeah, like, people are. you we know, are. because. Specifically as women, we are. Like, what will happen if I allow this to be soft? It's armor for so many people. We've if got I allow this to be to. soft, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let it be soft. Mm-hmm. But it's a practice, like you say. It's a practice. Yeah. Because we're not told to, Colette. We're not told to. I know, and this is what you teach, which I I found to be quite terrifying at first. Um, so the first time I did it, I'll admit I had I I even feel the feelings right now that I might cry, but I bawled my eyes out when I was like, "Oh my God, I have to let this go because mm. it, it's all I ever did was hold it in and tuck it in and do whatever." That was my way of almost like a warrior stance. Like then, and it, it is. Was, yeah, it was That's very exactly interesting. Is. I know in your workshops, a lot of tears happen. They do. They yeah. do. <laughs> they really do. And 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 good, right? And that's like if it's not if they're not crying, Colette's not working. No, I don't mean it like that, but it genuinely is because we've spent so many years no, no, holding, I know. holding, holding it all. And of course, as women, we can hold it all, but should we? No. Absolutely not. Like we're not here to hold it all. No, and should we? No, that's right. We can? Of course we can. Check us out. Oh, like you said at the don't. beginning. We can. Yeah. Should we? Yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Let's talk a little bit about the womb space as a medicine bowl mm. and having alchemical potential. Yeah. Right. Well, so I look at the, when I talk about the pelvic bowl, like I talk about, so the pelvic bowl is like this gorgeous cauldron, right? Some, some would say it's even like the Holy Grail that everyone's searching for. It's like to witness that we have this beautiful pelvic bowl, cauldron, medicine bowl space in which we can feel, like I said, so yes, you've, 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 you've already mentioned that we can hold trauma in that space, right? Of course we can. Yeah. And it has the potential 
to alchemize. Like we have like that space is all is available to us to create, whether that's life, whether that's an idea, whether that's a business, like it all comes from there. Like we, we, like I said, we get so up in our heads, but actually if we can come in and come down and down into this bowl, it's like we have access to, and in the new book, and I'm going to jump. I'm really sorry, Claire. I jump around as well. Like it's yeah, yeah, like yeah, in please. the new book, I talk yeah. about the pythoness, right? And the pythoness is this beautiful coiled um, potential voice, our voice, which mirrors the voice of the primordial serpent that you know that moves under the earth. And we have access to that. Like when we connect to that as source, we have access to this deeper voice, this deeper knowing that lies underneath all of the things like you just said that you know, we've had to, we have to unlearn. Like if we can get underneath it all, if we get underneath all of that programming, all of Mm -hmm. that beliefs and and behaviors we've been taught and sold and told are how we should be and actually can get underneath it and down, like come in, come down, come in, come down into our bodies, Mm -hmm. into that pelvic bowl, then what's possible there? Like that womb is like, it holds the imprint of the cosmic womb, right? So where there's no thing, anything is possible right so we've got this whole potentiality and if we do hold the trauma there we can use certain movements like that softening that deepening to really alchemize some of that so it's not about going oh you've just got to cut a cord which is totally cool by the way or you've just got to release the thing which is it can really work for a lot of people but for some specifically women who have held trauma specifically in their pelvic bowl who experience like you're talking about the pain in the psoas pain in the like thighs and the hips all of that because of and when I'm talking about trauma yeah there's like so many women hold big trauma but also riding a bike the trauma from riding a bike can still be held in our body like specifically in that kind of pelvic bowl and and the muscles that support and hold it right so it's about really recognizing Uh all the ways in which like we've held on and then working out ways to slowly 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 unwind versus like right, we're just going to change it up. We're not going to do that anymore. It's like slowly, slowly unpack, unfold, unwind, reveal. I love that you, I love that you talk about that because I do think that um, the expectation of quick fixes um, is something I've, you can have spontaneous Mm. remissions. I believe that. And I know that, yes, you're right. When you are really ready to stop repeating something and you know that you could make a choice, you could make a quantum leap. This is true too. But in my experience, my experience working in the field, the intuitive field for 35 years is that it, often it takes time it off it, and you have to allow yourself that that um space for that for the story to morph and change uh, it's not so quick as we like to think that it can be and it's not cut and dry and it's not um you know and i i actually think that that way often you know and i also believe too that what i love about your work is that you talk about that everybody has it you speak very inclusively about cycles and female energy, but you also, I'd love to also for our listeners who identify as women, but don't experience a cycle and may not have a womb specifically, how can they still access womb wisdom energy uh, as well? Because we have a lot of people who may identify and they're interested in this. Like I don't have what we consider a medical womb or, or a physiological womb. But like I say, there's there's a like the womb, the pelvic bowl. If we look at it more as a pelvic bowl that contains the potentiality for magic, right? So if you hold a womb in that space, awesome, right? Yeah, absolutely. We all have that, right? We all have this beautiful pelvic bowl and the potentiality to hold space. If you're in a female body, you may have held a womb in that space. Some people don't, and that's cool too. Like there's always going to be an energetic imprint in that space, right? Like so we yeah. can still use the energetics of this you know and in, in some um in some like religions that's called like a hara in a, in 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 men right like so in some spiritual paths like that's called yeah. a hara and so there's like there's energetics as well as the physicality right like so it's not like we're not just imagining you've got a womb we're just saying that there is an energetic imprint that you can call on and call up it just manifests differently in uh people who 
who aren't constructed to have an actual womb, but who's, you know, some, some people still identify as women, but don't actually have the construct of the womb. And some men who identify as men also can really benefit from your work. I just really wanted to, to make sure people understood that this is, this is for all of us. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to talk more about your new book because I think it's really pertinent to where we are now, but I do want to ask this one question because my favorite book of yours is called Witch. That's that's actually the first book I bought of yours. Thank you. And uh, so I want. <laughs> what is a witch, according to you? So according to me, it's a, and to, it's, and this is very personal. It means a woman in her power. And when I say woman, I also mean anybody that identifies in that way. But I means or it just means a human in their power. In that potentiality of me writing that book, it was about this woman in her power, and I'm, by that I mean me. It was about yeah. recognizing, wait, that's a word that's been used against so many of us, specifically women throughout yep. history, um, as a as a term not of endearment, right? And it's also been right, like, not so of endearment. Of us, not of endearment. And so and 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 you know, it, it's been used as a term of abuse for so many people. And it still is. Like I see it all the time. And we and we've all experienced different versions of what witch hunts look like too right and so big part yep. of it for me like whether that's online whether that's um like um in history mm-hmm. whether we ca- like many of us I believe as well which is why I think which probably has been the most popular book is because so many of us do remember carry some carry some of that wounding perhaps like from past lives in regards to like the witch hunts and so we and we're all like that's why so many of us as women are like always looking behind us like what's coming next like what's coming like that hyper vigilance because we hold on to this deep wounding of like that term and 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 we've we've done it and so that's why I always like, right. I'm like, we need to call it back in. There needs to be a reclamation process. And there needs to be yeah. like a, we are taking our power back. And so like every workshop I do in regards to whatever it's about, like I will gather the women and we will shout like, I call back my power now. Like, so that you can feel what that feels like when you're in yeah. like communion with uh-huh. other women, because it's pretty epic. And like you say, it's not just women. It's like anyone that feels the same call. Like, you know, we've all been different, various different on the spectrum of being human throughout our entire like lifetimes, right? So if you're not a woman in this yeah. life, you may have been one in a previous life. So you're still carrying that kind of understanding of what this is. So yeah, for me, it is a woman in her power. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like the reclamation of everything that has been used against us, like almost like the... Yeah, like the, the creatrix, the sorceress, like yeah. all of these things, like all of the things that where people are like, "Oh, that's bad. Oh, that's not okay." Like the cunning, the men, you know, the, the oh, healers, if you're cunning, then you're the cunning, the, healers. It, the people who were outside of specific, you know, over if you look at history and the Inquisition and all right. of the times when the weird W Y R R D weird women <laughs> and men, right? were those who lived outside of the specific um, dogma and rules of monotheism, right? That's the other thing, because this is very much about earth magic and belonging to the earth, belonging to our bodies as we belong to the earth. Exactly it. And think that's all the remembrance. Yeah, the remembrance. Exactly. I have that. I've had past life memories. Oh my gosh. Um, so I want to talk about, because your new book is really, I think is groundbreaking. So I want to go back to some of the things in self sorcery. So let's talk Hmm. about exactly what that means. What is self sorcery? (laughs) So it's a heavy emphasis on the word source, right? So, and it's obviously a play on words in terms of like sorcery and people kind of get all like up in themselves around like, oh, sorcery is about magic and it's all about, and it's like, yes, it is. But this is a heavy emphasis on the word source in order to source ourselves. Like we are living in wild times, right? You know that, we all know that we we are in it and we have chosen to be it at this time, no matter how much. I like to think I did not sign up for this. I absolutely did. (laughs) Um, I mean, I do have a word every now and again. Are you sure? Are you sure? But, um, <laughs> but, but I'm aware. Right, like, me so, too. Me in, too. In order to, right? 
But in order to fully show up, and by show up, I mean on our terms and in the way that is of most service, not in terms of like who, how someone on Instagram tells you you should be showing up, what you should be doing right. in response to a thing, what you should be doing in in X, Y, Z situations, right? But more about how do I source myself? Like what do I need in order to be able to show up fully? Like how can I connect at source with divinity as me recognizing that I am divinity? Like so how can yeah. I be sourced, fully sourced, so like self source so I'm like taking responsibility, I'm recognizing what's mine, I'm also recognizing what's projected as well, because I've right. got discernment, because that comes when we practice self sorcery is this beautiful discernment and refinement of, wait, I don't have to react to everything, right? I'm, I'm right. like, I'm, I'm witnessing like, oh, okay, I've got to get underneath all of that, because that's what I'm being told and sold. So I get underneath that. All right, so what's the song that's being sung? Like, what do I sense? Like, what song is being yeah. sung in my, in my deepest belly bones? And then recognizing that we have access to, like, all of these beautiful temple arts that we used to, that used to be so beautifully, like, just in us, like, innately in us, like, our ocular knowing, our, our vision, our sight, you know, like, our inner sight, our our inner voice, all of those things, and able to allow them to come to the forefront so we can remember the magic that we were able to spin, create, and, and make with those, with those sensorial kind of medicines and magic versus like what we're told we should be doing, how witchcraft should look, how, how healers should look. It's like it's all encompassing, but it's a remember to come back in, come down, be in your body, and recognizing that you are not what people tell you. What you were saying at the beginning, like we're unpro, it's an unprogramming, it's an unfolding of yeah. what we've been told to reveal. Then we yeah. can heal what's revealed if it needs to be. Then we can release yeah. what needs to be. We can recognize there's discernment, there's res- like I say, that refinement that comes so that you can then really use your cunning, you can really use your magic, your sensorial nature to do good yeah. like in the world and like who doesn't want to be like full up and realize that actually us full up is way more powerful than um us burnt out trying us to conformed. fit into everyone else's ideas yeah exactly yeah. exactly don't you find right now though it's pretty exciting because everything is unraveling and that we're just seeing it all unravel the things that are conditioned and I mean, the system. So let's assume, and we yes. don't have to talk about any one of them, but any of mm. the systems or the structures that we've even become unconscious of are now being um, dissembled. So what I heard you talk about, which just like, oh, um, we, we agree that everything is kind of unraveling. So now we can bring back what is source. And I love that you said that we are divinity. And I believe that we are made in the image of the divine, which is, which is nature. So, and it is within us, the blueprint of our own magic to co-create a world that comes from an authentic place of deep connection Mm. and compassion, mutual compassion. Um, and I always say that our, the greatest uh, cause of suffering in the world is spiritual disconnection and it cannot come from any kind of dogma. It's us plugging into source. And I love that you talk about self sorcery. And I also love that you, you kind of just threw out a couple of things. I'm like, wait, let's talk more about that. When you're saying about, well, what, which witchcraft needs to look like, or being a witch needs to look like, or a healer that, that we have to come to our own unique way of expressing those things. And that potentially these over overly structured ways that we are told is the only way needs to soften and be more flexible and resilient as we move forward. Um, you also mentioned the oracular, I, I, I call it oracular consciousness. Beautiful. Yeah. And so there, this exists in us, but it's atrophied. That's another wow. reason why there's a deep fear in all of us, because you know, that, that this is something that's been poo pooed. There's a new book out. I just read, I'm not going to say the name of it because it's not important, but I was reading this, this new bestseller all about how not to trust your intuition because it's really not that important. And I'm like, Oh my God, like <laughs> All right. it's the opposite. It's the, it's, this is 
This is what will create the wholeness. And I love that that is the the, the thread that runs through all of your work, yeah. the vulnerability that you share about us allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and not follow the crowd and yeah. not, uh, you know, we have to say it this way. Well, no, we're all finding our way. We're trying to find the best way. And this is all in flux right now. So anybody that gets too rigid, I find it's like, oh, you know, like we got to make a little more space for for the nuance right. that that change requires. Yeah. Because that's where grace comes in. Oh. It doesn't come in from being completely rigid about how things should be. Beautiful. And you cultivate grace. That's oh. what sorcery really is. <laughs> Your book is about cultivating grace. And be- thank you. Thank you. And, and there's a line in the book, Colette, that says that we have to create space for grace. That is absolutely so already. Ah. Already you're there. Already you're there. But it's true, right? I'm worried. I haven't read it yet. And that's yeah. all I ever try to do is create that space. So whether it's in our body, like whether it is coming down into our pelvic bowl and recognizing there's space for grace there, whether it's recognizing that there's space for grace in our spiritual practice, whatever that looks like. And like you say, having fierce compassion for ourselves because everything about, so if we're talking about self-sorcery, everything about that book, is a a deepening, a softening and a deepening into what we all already know. Like I'm not, I'm not. Yes. Right. I'm not trying to teach anyone anything new. It's literally a remembrance. It's a, it's a, it's a gift wrapped with love and chocolate and kisses from me. In order (laughs) to like remember what it is you already know. And I, cause I don't think any of us, like you say, in this time and in this place where like everything is in chaos, but mother is the, you know, they say, don't they? Chaos is the mother of all creation. And it's like, this is where we get to create. And that's the, this sorcery. This like, is the best time. Right. Yeah. And if we're in our body, this is the best time. If we can create for, if we're here present sourced from source at source as source, like if we recognize all of that, then we, we're we less likely to kind of take the hits that, that, that kind of maybe people that aren't tuned in in this way can so that we can support those that aren't. You know, there's no hierarchical system here. This is just about like if you are tuned in, it is your responsibility to first check in on you, make sure you're fully sourced, make sure you're full of it. Like I want to be a woman who's full of it so that the spillover becomes like medicine for everyone. Like that's the, that's the, that's the purpose. Don't try, don't try and be pulling from something that's depleted already. Like I want to be full up. You can call me a woman who's full of it. I'll take it because if I am, then I'm going to be useful. I'm not useful if I'm not full up. Uh, I love this. I'm not useful if I'm not full up. And I feel like that's what we're looking to do with that. Yeah. And we all bring our specific note to the harmony in life's symphony and we can't play somebody else's. I think that's, that's, I think that's at the real deep nature of projection right. too, you know, that the, like everybody is trying to grab something outside of themselves, yes. you know, when really it's right. It's like, Oh, you have that or no, you better do it that way. This, 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 this. But the truth is, is that, you know, when we fall back into something, like you said, we already know. We have to listen to our knowing. Yes. We have and to practice. learn to listen to it. And that's what I know. Oh. Yeah. Your work is all about that. And it's so exciting. So everybody, her book is called Sorcery, um, Self-Sorcery, uh, S O U. R C E dash E R Y, right? So it's called self sorcery. Anyway, let's, this has been such a great conversation. Let's pull a card oh, together yes, and see if there's anything else that we could be sharing about um, a subject that we might want to mm-hmm. share about. So this is from my deck, Wisdom of the Oracle. This is the deck that I teach with oh, in my yummy. school, in Oracle School. So let's see. What did we miss, if anything, or what does spirit? the great goddess, nature, source with a capital S, wants from us. What is it? What should we chat about? A change in the wind. So what this is about is the need for us to surrender 
when change comes that we don't recognize is is by our action, specific action. Right. So so it's about how do we respond mm -hmm. to the changes that are occurring um, that we don't believe we created specifically, right? So, and I think what this is talking about is that in general, all the turmoil and chaos, et cetera, that when we're in a reactive state, we're coming from our, we're not sourcing, we're not sourcing with a capital S, we're coming from our self and, and that the instinct for survival. Mm. So what, what would you say uh, about that? Um, how, what would be a tip for the listener? How can they better respond to life's changes when they didn't make the change happen? Beautiful, First. isn't it? And I feel like you've already answered it. So, um, and in exactly the way that I would, in the sense that this isn't about reaction. Like, and I see so many people reacting to absolutely everything that's unfolding in the world. And I get it. We've been taught, we've been hyped up, we've been like coiled, tightened, like a tight spring to react to absolutely everything. And if you don't react in the right way, then you don't care. And it's like, actually, but if, if we're able. Right to come back into our bodies and be like, okay, take a breath, take a beat even, you know, even if you can just take a step back from that thing before you hit send, before you speak, before you, you know, react and instead respond. Like that is, the, for me, that's the gold, like is, the, is in the response versus re reaction. Right, like reactionary is like mm -hmm. that is that kind of young kind of energy, which is beautiful. But like actually, this what we learn as we as we've experienced like the dark and the light and the dark and the light, and we keep experience mm -hmm. that cyclic nature that you talked about. You know that we witness in nature, but we also witness in our bodies, and we also witness in the cosmos. Is that there's a time for everything, right? So actually, if mm -hmm. you know that there's a cyclical a cyclical sorry um, nature to all things you are then able yeah. to sort of stay in your body a lot more with ease. There's a more, there's a more easeful way to be in your body so that not everything becomes a reaction so that you're able to feel what your response might be so that you can feel the words that you want to speak so that you can feel how you want to act instead of, instead of the, the reaction which is so mm -hmm. necessary right now, right? This is all we need. Like, it's right about now, love and yeah. compassion. Like, we need that. And we can only do that if we're able to create some space, if we're able to create, like, a little yeah. minute before we react and let yeah. it be a response. I think that's a, that's a maturing that's yeah. needed right now. I think everybody jumped so fast because they wanted to see instant results. Sure. But this is an entire generation of change. This may not even, what we want to see in the world may not even happen in our lifetime. You know, it's a, it is a call to re, to source, yes. like to source yeah. with a capital S and to consider mm. and to ask what is the compassionate, most respectful Beautiful. way yeah. to respond to this. And that only comes with slowing down. Yes. That comes with bringing our energy back. And for me, and this has been my experience, is that I, ha I have to stay in the day. Mm -hmm. I can't future pace. 24 hours is what I have, no. even though I still see the future and for I do sure. all this kind of very strange, but paradox. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, what can I do today, right now? And is this the is this the appropriate way for me to respond? Because I can be a very reactive. I've got all this freaking fired planets in my chart, <laughs> <laughs> which is like, ah, <laughs> so I want to go wham, <laughs> but that's not always the best way. So I have learned to slow down and ask my body, what is, what, what am I respond? What am I responding to? Because often what I found when I want to react, it's because I'm trying to protect myself. Yeah, of course. Or I'm trying and or trying to find certainty, try like righteousness or mm. all those things come from fear. They all yeah. it's always self-centered fear at the end of the day. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. So, Beautiful. I love that your work always addresses that. I love that you all your work does that. It's amazing. Anyway, this was so great. Um, we are going to move to a switch, we're gonna switch gears. Ooh. We're going to travel into another dimension of the Wooniverse called the Tea Time After Party <laughs> with lovely Connie Deletti. Uh, joining us now is my executive producer, Connie Deletti. Hey, Lisa. Hey. Lisa <laughs> and Connie. Okay. So I'm gonna ask the first question. Okay. 
When we had your husband Rich on, he spoke so highly of you and recounted meeting you as one of the most special moments of his life. Good. What's your favorite thing about Rich and what's Good. your version of the story? Because mm-hmm. <laughs> our listeners have heard his. Mm-hmm. And I haven't listened to his episode either. Um, like, so, <laughs> what's my favorite things about him? He's like total calmness like you know he is so beautiful he's got this he's like this gentle giant but he has this like really strong center and like I am like you said I'm all fire like I'm all fire or I'm all water one or the other or the other like he is just pure Mm. like mm, which is yummy it's a yummy to be in when you're in feminine flow and he's in masculine (laughs) kind of like strength it's like yummy but you know, it creates it creates all sorts of other issues as well, as you can imagine. But yeah. <laughs> um, and what's my version of how we met? Well, it wasn't cool at the time, but now like everyone meets online, don't they? Right? But like at the time, it really wasn't cool. And so we 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 had our first date on the beach. So we tell everyone like, oh, we just met on the beach. It was lovely. We're just walking along. <laughs> it was gorgeous, and we just had a moment, and we just saw each other. Our eyes met. It was gorgeous. But yeah, ultimately, we met online. <laughs> <laughs> I met my husband online too right. when it wasn't cool either. So that was it. No, <laughs> totally in 2000. When did we meet? 2002 or 2001 or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. It was like when I still had that big computer that was the size of a giant <laughs> box. <laughs> beep, bop, boop, bop, boop. Yeah. yeah. Beep, bop, beep, bop. <laughs> Oh, but I, I, I tell everybody he was a booty call that lasted 20 years. What can I tell you? <laughs> Love it. God bless Mark Love and it. his God sense of humor. God bless him. All right. God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this. Okay, your turn, uh, Connie. Okay, Lisa, rumor has it that you're a Scorpio. Rumor is, is right. Rumor is right. I can confirm. <laughs> 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 well, you're, you're amongst water signs. Colette is Cancerian. I'm also a Scorpio. Of course. So with all of your womb wisdom, what do you love best about being a Scorpio? Oh, about being a Scorpio. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's such a good question. Like, I want to say my sharp tongue because I am so good at like the mm. digs if I need to, but it's not a good quality, is it? That's not a good quality to shout about. But it's true. I have a sharp tongue. Depending, I, timing. I have a sharp tongue. I do. And a, and a very strong bite. Mm. Yeah, like don't mess with me. Like I am lovely. I am lovely until I'm not. <laughs> That's the joy. Like, I am a lovely person. Oh, goody. I love this. You used to create magical perfumes. Do you still do this? And what are your favorite scents to mix? Oh, yummy. Yeah, I do still do it. I still I love to do it. Um, <laughs> yes. My favorite is bergamot. I love bergamot. Oh, yummy, yummy. With grapefruit. Mm. That's actually like one mm-hmm. of my nice cleansing, energizing, yummy smells. But Mm -hmm. frankincense in anything is like just joyful and I've got very expensive taste so I love like all of the lotus flower like the oils which are like ridiculous amounts of money I love oud ridiculous amounts of money (laughs) girls got expensive I love oud yeah so good Mm -hmm. I love oud and bergamot together Mm -hmm. yummy yeah beautiful honestly so good I need lux ladies I have to get you to make me some I'm gonna buy some from you okay your turn Connie oh my gosh I love that Mm. I'm a huge perfume fan too or like just scents Mm. um okay um were you named after anyone yeah, Elvis Presley's daughter. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My mum and my dad oh, both really? loved. Really? Yeah, they both loved Elvis <laughs> Presley. Huge fans. Like we grew up, and so I just watched the Elvis movie recently, actually, and it was just joyful. I'm a big fan. Was it good? So wow, yeah. good. Mm. I mean, I love Baz Luhrmann as wow. well. Oh, so. so good. <laughs> so good. But yeah, so yeah. named oh, after Lisa Marie mm. Presley. Lisa Marie. Okay. Yeah. Lisa Marie Presley. <laughs> you that. were named after her. I love it. Okay. What is your favorite subject to go down the rabbit oh, hole on? Stop it. There's so many. So many. <laughs> stop it. Like now top I want to be top ten. Now I want to be like the proper spiritual person and have something really in the back. But like <laughs> no, no, I love like the, all of the all of the kind of burner accounts for real housewife people. Like those ones are my favorite. Like when they kind of <laughs> you know, when they're just like, oh, and this is happening behind the scenes. I'm like, oh, is it? So I love them. So that's that's definitely one. 
<laughs> but if you want a spiritual <laughs> answer, yeah. um, like mm. it is oracle cards. I love oracle. Like, I've designed my own, but I also mm. love other people's. Like I love yours, mm. and it's just like so. I love yeah. like fine, but I always want to know the story behind the art. I want to know why. Like so, that's mm. that's my spiritual answer. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's very funny. The Netflix, the Netflix answer. Well, I like Love Is Blind. I go Ooh, down the I rabbit hole on Love Is one. Blind. Love Is Blind Japan. Mm-hmm. Oh, Love Is <laughs> Blind Japan. Japan Love Blind <laughs> Brazil. Love Is Blind America. I love. <laughs> love it. Love and anything fantasy. Yeah, any anything at all that's fantasy. Okay. I will read the books. I will. Yeah, I like to escape into magic, yeah. like mm. the kind that's written about. Yeah, not not necessarily spiritual. We could have a sexy vampire thrown in there too, and I'd be happy. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Love it. Truth be told, right, Colette? Truth, Truth be, be told. told. Okay, you know, I don't let's want just, a sexy you know, vampire. I don't want one of okay. them. <laughs> Okay, Lisa, if you were to wear a t-shirt with one word for a whole year, what would that word be? Hmm, power. Like power, because it can mean mm-hmm. everything, can't it? Like it's almost like that soft power, mm-hmm. that power that you're calling up, the power that you're putting out, the power that you're energizing. Like I feel like for a year to rev- mm-hmm. and, and almost just to remind ourselves, because we so often forget that we're that we're powerful in a world that wants us to always be powerless, mm-hmm. right? Like so mm-hmm. For me, power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about you two? Oh, I love that. that. What would oh. you wear? I don't know. Oh, oh. chocolate. Oh. Different chocolate. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. I have no idea. That would probably be wrong. That's chocolate. Chocolate. Or don't speak till I've had my coffee. I'm only allowed to have one word. Coffee. <laughs> Love it. Love it. That's a great one. I don't know. I feel like mine's going to say wow. Just wow. Nice. Wow. Because it's like a a, re, a re-engagement of the wonder, staying in that curious mind and like everything. There can you can approach anything from wow, oh, and it's true. Why not? <laughs> why not? Woman of wonder. It can stand for woman of wonder too. Oh, woman, of, woman wonder. of wonder. Woman of wonder. I was gonna say, I was gonna say awe, but then you said wow, which was better than awe. But so I'll take magic. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> All right, you know what? Let's let's get into a technique now Ooh. because I'm sure everybody wants to know a little bit about what your favorite one is. So, what's one of your favorite techniques? or rituals that you use to connect with the sacred or source? What to, what, what do you do every day? Do you, do, do you have one that yeah, you do every clearly. day that you love the most? I think like we overcomplicate everything, don't we? Like everyone loves like a ritual <laughs> or, a, or a ceremonial. Like what can we do? And it's like, what about if like we just place a hand on our heart, hand on our belly, hand on our mm. womb space, softened. Like and literally took in some big deep breaths mm. in through the nose held it and then released it really noisily and audibly (sighs) (sighs) and like we did that a couple of times (sighs) and then we land we can Mm. land deeper right because it's like I say so many of us stay so high up in our bodies because it's how we kind Mm -hmm. of function and get on if we can just take that breath as deep as it goes and it takes a bit of practice but it can get down to our womb space and when that breath can get down yeah. to there, like we can oxygenate that space and then it becomes juicy and, and fecund and yummy and full of possibility. Love it. Ah, this is so great. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. You can learn more about Lisa and all of her offerings by going to her website, lisalister.com, or you can click on the link in the description and be whisked away to our show notes page where you'll find everything you need to know about Lisa, her new book, and this episode. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lisa. That was an awesome conversation. We so enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. And everybody, you got to get her book. (laughs) (laughs) What a great conversation with Lisa Lister. Uh, I really loved her book, Witch. I found it to be just her storytelling. She's a real storyteller. I hope people get her book and her latest book as well, too. She's really quite extraordinary. Um, When I asked the question, what did we learn today? I chose a card from Wisdom of the Oracle which is my teaching deck. And interestingly, I got the card called Deep Knowing. And it's it's a, you see an owl sitting on the moon. And it's funny because Lisa actually teaches about lunar cycles in all of her work and, and na- natural cycles, et cetera. But this really reminds us that the knowledge that we seek, the really deep knowledge about our purpose, our destiny as human beings on this planet, on this earth, 
can't be found outside of ourselves. The deep knowing exists already within us. And that's what Lisa spoke about today, is that inside us, we already know who we are. We already know why we're here. We just need to remember. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm Colette Baron reed Be well. Be well.